Good evening, friends. Good to see you. Very thankful for the, the good number that we have out tonight and the diligent effort that's been put forth to worship our God this evening. It's been a very encouraging effort so far, and I just really commend those who have had a part. And I'm just uh, really encouraged by the devotion that is here. Um, a lot of good things happening, a lot of exciting things that are unfolding, and uh, I'm just real excited about the future of this church. A lot of positive things uh, about to occur. Uh, do want to make note of a special study we're going to have next quarter on the lifetime challenge to serve the master, and that's going to be a very good study with our brother Gerald and our brother David Landfair teaching that class, and it's going to especially be directed toward the college age uh, students or uh, people in that age group and so I encourage you to be mindful of that but we have uh, a lot of good things that are occurring and I'm just uh, really excited about all that is happening and I want to share a thought with us this evening and my goal is very simple my goal is to make sure that we're reminded of the importance of loving God from our heart. I don't believe that can be overstated because God lets us know that when he looks at us, he looks beyond the exterior. He looks beyond what you and I see and he goes straight to the mind. He goes straight to the spirit or the soul. And this is brought out when a king was being chosen for the people of God and as Samuel is going to Jesse and his family and his sons are brought forth, the first seven sons are brought out and the first one that came up, as it says here, of Eliab, and he says, surely, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. So apparently this man was a great looking man and he just had all the charisma, the physique. And when the prophet saw him, he said, this has to be our next king. This guy has it. And of course, the Lord responds by saying to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And that's what I want us to be mindful of this evening, that God sees us with who we are in the heart. And that our heart needs to be in tune with him and fully connected to him in serving him. You might recall, again, I made some reference to this this morning. When a person came to Jesus, and he was testing Jesus, you know, what can I do to inherit eternal life? It's still a good question. And it's a question we can ask with sincerity. What can I do to have eternal life? And Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And I just want us to consider, when God looks at us tonight, does he see somebody who is fully in love with him? Fully in love with him, with all of their strength and soul, with whatever time and ability and energy we have left. Does God see something special in us that he's seen in so many other people in times like that of David? Does he see the very same fabric of heart within us that David had? Can he look at us and know, I really love my God? Well, there's a lot of different ways we could take this thought. And believe it or not, I want to take it to Ezekiel. <laughs> I mean, that's a perfect transition, right? It makes a lot of sense. Go to Ezekiel after all this. Because there's something that's said in Ezekiel. And Ezekiel, of course, was a prophet of God. And he was special because he was sent among the captives that went to Babylonian captivity. He was in that second group that was taken. And as he is among the captives, it says in Ezekiel chapter 8 that as he is in the sixth year of captivity, God pulls him up by the hair and he shows him some things in a vision. And in this vision, he's going to go to the temple. And what God is going to do is show him section by section of the temple and make some comparisons to what he saw in the hearts of his people. 
what was evident in their minds and in their heart, which had led, of course, to their judgment. And, of course, God is letting Ezekiel know how deeply offended he was, that his people were not loving him from their heart. And so in Ezekiel chapter 8, and if you want to mark that, that's what he's going through at this time. And he is having this encounter with God. And, of course, God is showing him things that, that the other person or the average person could not see, but God was very aware of. And I believe it's a profound context for us to look at our own heart and to see if God sees the same things in us that he saw in them at that time. I mean, really, what's in your heart tonight? What does God see within your heart and in your relationship with him? And I'm just going to go through this little chapter here and show us what he said about them to see if it can be said of you and I. And of course, obviously, to protect our heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life, is what Proverbs 4 says. Protect your heart. Protect your heart with all diligence. And so God shows this man four visions, and they all, of course, center around the temple. And the first vision he showed them was an image of jealousy that was at the door. The exterior, the first entrance into the temple court. And he says in Ezekiel chapter 8, in verse 4 beginning, Behold, the glory of the God of Israel was there, like the vision that I saw on the plain. Then he said to me, Son of man, lift your eyes now toward the north. So I lifted my eyes toward the north, and there, north of the altar gate, was the image of jealousy in the entrance. Furthermore, he said to me, Son of man, do you see what they are doing the great abominations that the house of Israel commits here to make me go far away from my sanctuary. And then he says, of course, turn again, I will show you even greater abominations. But you see the first one he points out, you, is, Ezekiel, can you see it? I mean, again, he's holding the man by his hair. That's what it says. That he's being held by the hair in this vision. And he says, do you see what I see? Do you see what's happening at the very entrance of my temple? where I can't even go there because of what's there. Do you see the image of jealousy that these people put up? Now, of course, he's referring back to the actual idolatry that they did engage in. And I'm not going to read all these verses. You can look at them yourselves. But we were kind of reminded of this, I believe it was last week, when we talked about Josiah. You know, Josiah, of course, uh, his grandfather was Manasseh. And he was a, a man who was righteous, Josiah was, but his grandfather was very wicked. Just really took the people of God to a whole different level of wickedness, despite what his father, Hezekiah, had done to try and remove it from the land. And so Manasseh was leading the people in all types of idolatry. And then grandson Josiah comes in, he tears these things away, he gets rid of them. But what's happening here later as the people of Judah have been taken into captivity, is that here we have people that live just shortly after Josiah, and they've already gone back to idolatry. They've already gone back to the things that Josiah took away. And here they're practicing idolatry again, and you have the image of jealousy as God describes it. And that's, of course, what God wanted them to know, that in practicing idolatry, he was a jealous God. Now, I do want to read these verses here at Exodus chapter 20. In Exodus chapter 20, one thing God wanted his people to know as he had this covenant with them was that he did not want them to practice idolatry, and he told them this 800 years before they actually did it. And he said, look, the time's going to come when you're going to want to practice what's being done in the land. Don't do it. Don't do it because I'm jealous over you. In Exodus chapter 20, I, I read for us in verses 3 through 5, where he says, You shall have no other gods before me. You shall make, not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy of, to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. 
So one of the Ten Commandments is you cannot have these graven images. Now, of course, he's talking about images that you would bow down and worship. That's what he was getting at. You can't do this. And the one reason you can't do this is because I'm jealous. And you can understand that. I mean, if you got on your spouse's phone, your girlfriend, boyfriend, or husband or wife's phone, and you saw an image of them with their ex, you'd be a little upset about that. You would be upset about that because you're not going to share their affection with someone else. The affection you have for them, you expect them to have that back for you, and you're not going to let them share that affection with someone else. You want that full devotion as you are fully devoted to them. You would be jealous if your spouse had a picture of an ex or some other person that they had fondness for. You would be offended. And God is no different. He's given us his all. He's fully invested in his people. Totally committed to, to loving his people. And he expects the same type of response from us as he did from his people Israel. In Exodus chapter 34, I read for us in Exodus chapter 34, I read for us beginning in verse 12. And again, this is keep in mind, this is hundreds of years before Ezekiel and his generation came on the scene. And yet he says in verse 12, Ezekiel 34, Take heed to yourself, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land where you're going, lest it be a snare in your midst. But you shall destroy their altars, break their sacred pillars, cut down their wooden images. You shall not, or you shall worship no other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous god. Lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land and they play the harlot with their gods and make sacrifice to their gods and one of them invites you and you eat of his sacrifice and you take of his daughters for your sons and his daughters play the harlot with their gods and make your sons play the harlots with their gods. You shall make no molded gods for yourself. And we even heard that in the reading tonight. As Steve pointed out in Acts 19 that that which is made with hands is not a god. There's no power in that. And that's what God was saying back here, that there is no power in these things. But what it can do is it can stir some deep emotions from within me. It can cause me to have jealousy when you love someone besides me. And when you love the things of this world or the portrayed gods of this world, when you love them, you have affection for them more than you do for me, it hurts me. It hurts me, and I am jealous from it. And of course, the question that must follow this is, are we going to do Are we going to return to the evil that Josiah worked so hard to expel from the land? You know, he did so much effort to try and get rid of it, and yet the people have quickly gone back into it and are suffering. What about us? Are we going back into the things which God has forbidden, and yet even possibly are parents or grandparents work so hard to come out of? Are we going back into that ideology or even the idolatry? I think of this family who works so hard, and they're still faithful today, this couple, an older couple, somewhere else, very godly people, dedicated, thoroughly dedicated to the Lord. And what's special about them is this husband and wife had worked so hard to come out of a denomination that they were brought up in. And they were unaware of the truth, and they were practicing things that God did not authorize. And so they learned the truth, they came out of it, but they, it was a struggle for them to do this. Because their families are so steeped in this other faith. But they made the effort to come out, and for decades they've been serving the Lord faithfully. In practicing New Testament Christianity as it's defined in the Bible. But what's so sad is that one of their children has gone back to that faith that has been swayed by possibly other family members to adopt those ideas and go back to the very thing that the parents worked so hard to come out of. And of course, you can know that God is jealous from that. What about it, friends? I mean, really, is he everything to us? Are we totally dedicated to the Lord? Paul told the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verses 21 and 22, you've you got to pick a side. You cannot waffle on this. 
You've got to be fully invested with the Lord. He says in verses 21 and 22, You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and of the table of demons. Or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Same thing. Very same thing. It didn't stop with the people of Judah. Same thing. God gets just as jealous with us when our heart is split in trying to serve things of this world versus serving him. Same thing. He still has emotions over his people and our affections. And so that's the first thing he says in Ezekiel chapter 8. You see, you see this, Ezekiel? But if you go back to Ezekiel chapter 8, he shows him another vision regarding the temple. And he's just going to keep going closer and closer within the temple. And he brings up this second vision, it's which is found in verses 7 through 12. I'm going back to Ezekiel chapter 8. He says, again, at the end of verse 6, he says, okay, it's bad, right? This image of jealousy, bad stuff, right? Well, I'm going to show you even greater, he says, even greater abominations. And so in verse 7, it says, So he brought me to the door of the court, and when I looked, there was a hole in the wall. Then he said to me, Son of man, dig into the wall. And when I dug into the wall, there was a door. And he said to me, go in and see the wicked abominations which they are doing there. So I went in and saw, and there, every sort of creeping thing, abominable beasts, and the idols of the house of Israel portrayed all around on the walls. And there stood before them 70 men of the elders of the house of Israel, and in their midst stood Je Jezaniah, the son of Shaphan, each man had a censer in his hand, and a thick cloud of incense went up. Then he said to me, Son of man, have you seen what the elders of the house of Israel do in the dark? Every man in the room of his idols. For they say, The Lord does not see us. The Lord has forsaken the land. So what he's doing here is, of course, there's a hole in the wall. And... What he's saying is, okay, I want you to dig through and you find this door. And what it did is it took him into the inner chambers of the priest who were there along the wall of the temple. And he says, as, as I got in there and started seeing their private life, what I saw was something totally different than what was portrayed exterior, on the exterior. They're supposed to be priests, right? Servants of God. But when you go back to their inner heart and their private life, there was a total different world of darkness, a total different world of ungodliness. And that's the point God was trying to get him to see, that he was fully aware of the secret sins his people had engaged in. And that's what this hole in the wall represented. And so he says, I want you to know that I see these private abominations that they were engaging in. When they thought no one else was around, no one else could see them. God says, I see them. And of course, the implication is he was offended by them. These were people who had the appearance of godliness, the priest. These are people who are supposed to be leading the people and serving God, but they were engaged in evil. That's why I'm just saying, going back to what I started out with, I hope the one thing we leave this lesson with is that we love God with all of our heart, fully devoted to him in all things, and there is no such thing as a secret sin in our life. Now, do we sin? Absolutely. Do we struggle with sin? Absolutely we struggle. We all struggle with sin, constantly struggle with sin. But the difference is that we have this commitment to the Lord to put away our sin and not remain in our sin, certainly not live in our sin, even in a private manner. But it, it happens. You know, it, it doesn't take long for the people of God, for all of us, to be tempted to make some bad choices. One bad choice, if we hang on to it and remain in it, can lead to another bad choice. And before we know it, we have this whole double life we're engaged in. When it was not who we were even moments ago because of our devotion to God. You have to be careful about what enters your heart and what is allowed to linger there. And that's why you and I have got to constantly fight against evil which wars against our soul constantly. We have to put up that fight and do our best to suppress the evil that's ever before us. And you know what I'm talking about. I guess one of the most uh, painful
painful stories I, I heard on this was because I, I knew everybody involved. Somewhere else, but it was a situation where this church was contemplating hiring a preacher. They were going through that process of looking, trying to find the right guy. They found somebody that was interested in working with them. And so the men, there were no elders, so the men were getting together to discuss this decision. And one of the men was very outspoken about bringing in this guy because he was a preacher who had a past. Hadn't lived like that in some time, but he had a past, and this guy was very adamant about not having someone like that work with them. And one of the brothers who was there at the men's meeting, he said to this brother, and I'm just going to call him Joe, he says, oh, Joe, we all know what it's like. We've all done things that we shouldn't have done. We all have a past. Wouldn't you agree, Joe? And people who were there told me this, and even Joe himself told me this, when I eventually met up with them. But what Joe thought this brother was talking about was Joe. Because at that time, that brother, who was so adamant about bringing in a preacher who had a past, was at that time having an affair with a woman at work. And he thought this brother was bringing that out in the meeting when he says, oh, we all have a past, don't we, Joe? We all have done things we shouldn't have, don't we, brother? And, of course, this brother was touched in the heart thinking he had been exposed. And so at that moment, those who were there told me that, yeah, he started breaking down. He confessed, yeah, I've been doing this. I've been, been living this double life. So easy for anybody to do. So easy for any of us to get caught up in a secret sin. Beware, your sins are going to find you out, is what God says. And so we have to be people, as God is pointing out right here in Ezekiel, is you've got to look at your heart. God sees the heart. He sees what's happening. And if there is some secret wickedness taking place, get rid of it. Humble yourself and repent and pray and love your God the way you should. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 13, it says, There is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. We're all exposed before him. So why not let him see some secret devotion, some secret love and secret effort and commitment and struggle to love him? He sees that. Why not honor him with that type of commitment? That's a very good thing to think about. That's what God wants us to do. It doesn't matter what you do. He wants you to serve him with all of your heart, which really was mentioned in our prayer tonight of, of making sure we, we live this honorable example, serving him in all that we do. I see the same thing in Ephesians chapter 6. And here he's talking about your work as bond servants. And he says even that can be used as a way of honoring God, your employment. In Ephesians chapter 6 where he says that you're not going to do your work with eye service, verse 6, as men pleasers, but as bondservants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. So he said, look, look, brother, you may be a bondservant, but you view your situation as a way of serving God. You're not serving man, you're serving God. You're honoring him with the situation you're in. That's just a wonderful principle. Everything I do is to be in devotion to God, honoring him from the heart instead of having some secret idolatry. Let me keep going in Ezekiel chapter 8, where he points out in verses 13 and 14 a third vision. And again, he's just keeping, he's going deeper and deeper within the temple. And now he comes to the inner court. And he said to me in verse 13 and verse 14, Ezekiel 8, Turn again, and you will see greater abominations than, the, than that, that they are doing. So he brought me to the door of the north gate of the Lord's house, and to my dismay, women were sitting there weeping for Tammuz. Then he said to me, Have you seen this, O son of man? Turn again, you will see greater abomination than these. Now, from what I understand, when these women would weep, for this pagan goddess, which is, of course, being pointed out in that section of the temple, is that they were 
given, of course, as was true with so much of idolatry, there was always a shade of immorality. It just, the majority of it was. But apparently this pagan goddess was a beautiful goddess who was trapped and forced to live between the earth and the lower world and was forced to be in that condition in misery. And so to honor this goddess, they would worship her with grief, with afflicting the body, tearing off the hair, or even given, of course, to prostitution. And all of that is implied when he says that I see this happening with these women. They're worshiping this goddess this way. They're weeping for her. And of course, they were weeping for this God, and yet they were not weeping for the God of heaven. And so God, of course, always wants us to be people who are sorry for the right reasons, right? He wants us to have godly sorrow. And that we need to be people who are sorrowful, especially for our sins. I go to Hosea, Hosea chapter 7, where again he's just simply pointing out what, what really disturbs you, what, what really upsets you. I mean, is it the affairs of this world, the affairs of this nation, some pagan goddess, is that what really causes you to weep? Or is it what's happening in my relationship with you or the future of my people? What, what really concerns you? Hosea chapter 7 says this in verses 13 through 15. Woe to them, for they have fled from me. Destruction to, to them, because they have transgressed against me. Though I redeemed them, yet they've spoken lies against me. They did not cry out to me with their heart. When they wailed upon their beds, they assembled together for grain and new wine. They rebelled against me. Though I disciplined and strengthened their arms, yet they devised evil against me. God is very offended by us or his people when there is within our heart sorrow for this world and no sorrow for him that's what he's saying Where, when, are you weeping when, when have you wept for me what I've done for you and how you betrayed me when, when have you cried about that you know I think that would be a parallel with what Jeremiah or Ezekiel is pointing out where's the weeping over that you know what about it I mean I, you're upset I'm upset about the condition of our nation a any of us can have some deep concern about the future of this nation. That Who wouldn't be at this time? And that's a right response to have, right concern to have. But think about it. Are we more concerned about the future of this nation than we are the future of this church? I mean, really, what really keeps us up at night and keeps us tossing and turning in the bed at night? Is it our deep concern for the lost souls around us? or even for our own sins that we may have committed. What really causes us to toss and turn? Is it the politics, the economy, or is it souls unprepared to meet God, who don't know God? Really, what really causes us to weep? And that's what he's saying here. When have you wailed for me? When have you cried over me and what I'm going through? And so that's a, always, again, a, a good thing to be mindful of, to always be sensitive to our sins or sensitive to our relationship with God. Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 2, another good reference, you know, of where God is going in before his people at this time, and, and he's looking at the heart. I don't have verse 15 on there, but I should have. Let me read Jeremiah 2 and verse 15. That's a good one to include. Uh, no, I'm in the wrong context. Um, I'm sure that's a good verse, but no, that's a different reference here. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 2. <laughs> I'm going to stay with what I got here. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 2. It's verse 5, I should have. Yeah, there it is. Jeremiah 2 and verse 5. What injustice have your fathers found in me, that they have gone far from me, have followed idols, and have become idolaters? And then verse 6. Neither did they say, where is the Lord, who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, who led us through the wilderness? Now, what he's pointing out here in saying, where is the Lord, he's saying... My people never said, okay, let's get God's opinion on this. Let, let's get his counsel. Let's see what he wants us to do. That's what he's saying when he says, where is the Lord? And the people weren't saying that. He says, I've, I've led them through the wilderness, through a land of deserts and pits, through a land of drought and shadow of death, through a land that no one crossed and where no one dwelt. I brought you into a bountiful country to eat its fruit and its goodness, but when you entered, you defiled my land. And made my heritage an abomination. The priest did not say, where is the Lord? And those who handled the law did not know me. 
The rulers also transgressed against me. The prophets prophesied by veil, veil and walked after things that do not profit. What, when have they thought about me, sought me out, is his point. And I, I think that's a really good thing for us to be mindful of as well. Let me say one last thing here, and that is the fourth vision. Because as you keep going inner, deeper and deeper into this temple, well, then now you come to the most sacred section of the temple of all into the Holy of Holies and where the altar would have been and all that. And it says in Ezekiel chapter 8, he goes on to say in verse 15, Have you seen this, O son of man? Turn again, you will see greater abominations than these. So he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and there at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about 25 men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east. And they were worshiping the sun toward the east. He said to me, have you seen this, O son of man? Is it a trivial thing to the house of Judah to commit the abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence. They have returned to provoke me to anger. Indeed, they put the branch to their nose. Therefore, I will also act in fury. My eye will not spare, nor will I have pity. And though they cry in my ears with a loud voice, I will not hear them. And so he's offended by something. And he's offended by these 25 men. Now, of course, there were 24 priests that served there at the temple, at the altar, and the high priest would have made 25. That's what he's getting at in identifying these, this group of people. But he says, I'm offended because their back is toward me. In other words, they're worshiping something else. And what they're worshiping is the sun, as it points out here. And that is a specific sin God warned them about. Don't worship the sun. Don't worship the moon. Don't worship the planets, the stars. Don't get into that. Because he knew this was a part of the belief system of the land they were going to possess. In Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 19, I read for us where he, he warned them this again years ago. He says, take heed, lest you lift your eyes to heaven, and when you see the sun, the moon, and the stars, all the host of heaven, you feel driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord your God has given to all the peoples under the whole heaven as a heritage. Well, I've never been provoked to do that. One of the benefits of getting up early, which I love to do, is that I leave and it's still dark, and the, I love going out when it's just so dark outside. The Lately, it's been beautiful, clear skies. And I, even this morning, I look up, and my goodness, the stars that are up there. And my response is, how great thou art. What a great God we serve. Not once has I, have I ever been provoked. Like, That's my star. I'm going to bow down to that star. Not once. But see, these people were taught to do that. And the priest, that's what he's saying, these 25 men have their back to me, and they're worshiping the sun, which I, of course, warned them about. And that, of course, is a contrast with Josiah. Josiah was the last godly king, and he removed the idols, but one thing he could not do was change the heart. He could remove the idols from the land, but if the people still wanted those things, it was inevitable that they would return to them. And that's what he's saying has happened. They've gone back to it. They haven't changed from the heart. Friends, God is going to judge us based on our heart. He did it before. We talked about that in class this morning. When God saw that the thoughts and intents of the hearts of man were on evil continually, he judged mankind with the flood. Well, the same thing is going to be true with us. He's going to judge us for our heart. And that's why it is so important that you protect your mind day in and day out. I read for us in Ecclesiastes, you know these verses, very good though. Where he says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. And the same thing, of course, is something we all need to be mindful of. So what does God see in our heart tonight? I, I see a person who's devoted, because you're here obviously trying to put him first in life. And again, I'm very encouraged by your devotion to the Lord. But what does God see? That's what counts most. You know, what does he see with us? And I'm confident that he sees a group of people who are determined to love him with everything we have. 
But we've got to be careful, and we've got to be wise knowing that the devil is going to try and undermine that commitment. If you're here and you're not a child of God, we hope you would give your heart to the Lord and obey his gospel. And if you understand what that means, we, of course, encourage you at this time to obey that beautiful gospel of having all your sins washed away by the blood of Christ. And that happens by faith when you obey his plan of acknowledging him, turning away from sin, and being immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins. And you're in Christ at that point, Galatians 3.27. Could be you've done some things either publicly that need to be corrected. We understand sin, and we'll help you. We'll pray for you as you turn away from that and confess those. Or it could be privately. Fall on your knees. Beg God for mercy. Acknowledge your weaknesses to him, and he will lift us up. He's faithful and just to forgive us, but we have to come to him with all of our heart. And so if you're subject to the Lord's invitation, please respond to him as we stand and sing.